Welcome to today's episode of The Square. I'm really excited to be joined by Lindsey Wilson, president of Corgan. I was a big fan before you were president, just for the record. Uh, my first, my, the first video project I did here was with you for Fossil. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, that's what that's what started it all. That's really how we trace the squares roots all the way back it's to all Fossil. all the way back to Fossil. Okay. <laughs> so um, we'll, I want to talk a little bit about your journey to becoming president in a few minutes. But before we get to that, tell me a little bit about why you're even in the design field to begin with. I think I would trace it back to two, two things. The most basic is just always the love of arts and creativity and finding a way to turn that into a career. Um, my mom actually used a residential designer, which in our town was pretty unusual. <laughs> it was um, a guy who drove from Little Rock. And so the value of kind of creating a place is something that was really instilled in me. I don't think I could have described it that way, yeah. but the care that my parents kind of took with creating our home, coupled with a love of art and design, it wasn't until I got to college that I actually knew that commercial interior design was a field like that even I could- existed. Even existed. <laughs> yeah. I um, was a business major originally, and then thought I'm probably not gonna get through college this way. <laughs> um, it was not quite enough of hands-on activity in those classes. And then I considered being an art history major and my dad said, um, try again. <laughs> um, worried how employable I might be. There's uh, my, not... my parents had the same conversation when I said I was a communications major, so I yeah, understand Yeah, so <laughs> art history majors usually become professors or involved with museums and, yeah. and there, there wasn't a whole lot of opening there. And then I made my way into the interior design department at the University of Arkansas and met uh, the professors there, one of whom had been a hospitality designer in New York City. And really that's when this idea of like business and people and creativity could all come together as a career. So it wasn't really until college. I wasn't one of the people who was. So you weren't like doing like a bunch of crafts and redecorating the room every week growing no. up? No. And it was really the love then of once we got into the program or once I got into the program of the commercial side of things, mm -hmm. the larger scale programming and planning, kind of solving the puzzle um, of putting all those pieces together, even even understanding the open office environment. I still remember learning about that for the first time and kind of how you planned an open office environment and just finding it really fun. So fascinating. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your journey at Corrigan because um, it's a little bit unusual because you actually, you started at Corrigan. Yeah. And then you left for a while. So I interviewed to work at Corgan in the resource library at the University of Arkansas. Oh, wow. So Anna Chandler used to come to Arkansas to recruit. She hired three of us, I think, that day um, wow. from our program at the University of Arkansas to come work at Corrigan. And then and what did you know of Corgan at the time? I knew, you know, what was sold in the <laughs> in the recruiting. In the brochure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, small town Arkansas girl. Um, my mom and I came. We drove from the on like a to find an apartment visit. Yep. We drove from the airport, DFW, to the Corgan office, which was the office at the time out on American Airlines oh, campus, yeah, not okay. our not our downtown office. Um, and then out from there, we started looking for apartments. So it wasn't until I was signing a lease that I was like, "Where's Ulysses?" <laughs> Didn't really fully grasp that we were not in Dallas. Dallas. <laughs> Just a so short drive that away. kind of revealed. This is like before you had a phone. I mean, we had a map, a yeah. literal map, and an apartment guide. You remember a the Mapco? A Mapsco. A Mapsco. That's right. And do you remember the apartment, the apartment guide? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And that was it. So then you started at Corgan, mm -hmm. and were you in? I mean, I'm assuming you were in the interior design team. I was on the aviation team. Aviation team. Okay. Uh, specific working for. Steve Holsey's wife, Deb, okay. um, who led the team that we did everything for American Airlines back then. We were really their in-house. Every move, ad, change, every project they had came straight through our team and was assigned. There was a large group of interior designers, whether it was one office being relocated or one of the projects I did was the 
uh, American Airlines used to have their publishing group internal to the airline. Right. It was American Airlines Publishing. That was my first like real project project where it started at the beginning with the program. They were getting to move out into their own building and kind of create their own little subculture. Yeah. And that's where I think I really saw the possibilities of like creating a workplace where people spend a ton of their time and how impactful it could be. Well, and being the publishing offices, you know, versus some of the operations side needing to have a space that they could be creative in. Absolutely. And they had unique program requirements. You know, they were ch had rooms where they were laying up the whole magazine, where they were color checking all of their print materials. So, so a lot of details that mm -hmm. I hadn't been engaged in in a project before and really working as part of a, of a team. So how long were you on that project? Oh, gosh. I mean, I, I remember it being a fairly typical, so it should have been done within the course of a year, probably. Okay. Yeah. And then what happened after that? After that, I don't remember exactly, but I had definitely gotten the bug for office projects mm -hmm. big time. And being on the aviation team, that's actually when the firm had been awarded Terminal D. Oh, wow. The International Terminal out at DFW. So that was really kind of a shifting point in time where the vast majority of the people on the aviation team out there where I was were going to be working on Terminal D. And I really wanted to be working on strictly office. office stuff. So shortly after that is when I, when I left for another opportunity. And where'd you go? after you left there. I went to Boca Pal. Okay. And then and Boca Pal was only doing really commercial office and interiors at that time. They do more yeah. than that now, but And then you you hopped around to a couple of places, right? All kind of focused on I that did. idea of office. I worked at all office from that point on. Um, I worked at Boca Pal for about five and a half years and that's when I started doing business development. And mm -hmm. that's when I really became aware of the real estate industry as a whole yeah. and all the people that it took to make a deal happen, the brokers, the lawyers, the developers, and this really vibrant, fun um, community within Dallas-Fort Worth that, that is the real estate community, contractors, engineers, kind of this whole network and how those relationships really led to project opportunities. So, so that was probably the most formative part of working at, at Boca it kind Pal. of rounded out your view of the industry because you had not just the art artistry, but the business side of it. Yes, and the people side of it mm -hmm. and the strategy to this day, which is absolutely my favorite thing, is when I think we're the right firm or the right team for an opportunity, there's nothing more fun than putting together the strategy to explain that or show that to yeah. the potential client that why they should hide, hire us. And that really started during that really five and a half years of my career. So then what brought you back to Corgan? What brought me back to Corgan? So, so after Boca Pal, I made two other stops, one at an all interiors firm, small boutique, just doing all interiors. I've I wanted to check that out. And then I worked for a short time at a furniture manufacturer, which was super interesting to kind of observe observe the design industry from that perspective. Angle, yeah. And kind of see how people worked with their clients, what clients kind of said when they weren't uh, <laughs> with, the, with their design partners. Yeah. That wasn't my intent. Um, I took it because it was a business development opportunity, but that's really what I learned. And then um, a, a senior person in the interiors group here at Corgan had left. And so there was an opportunity really to rethink Corgan's approach in Dallas um, to the interiors marketplace. And my old friend, Matt McDonald, who I had stayed friends with the entire time I had been gone from Corgan, which had been 10 years, um, he called me up and as the agent, I think, um, and said, you know, would you ever come back to Corgan? And I said, I, I don't know, maybe, you know, I had great, great memories of working here, but yeah. I had never worked in the, in the Dallas main office. Yeah. 
And so I came and I met with Bob Morris and John Holtzheimer, and I will never forget it, although Bob is always like, is that really the first question I asked? And I'm like, <laughs> yes. Um, it would made such a memory on me, but it was just how he thought about things. He said, why don't you tell us what you want to do, and then we'll tell you what we're wanting to do, and we'll see if the two things sync up. <laughs> That's such a typical Bob question. Such I a love Bob that. thing. <laughs> Instead of diving in with like, you yeah. know, not dancing around it. We're just going to get straight to it. <laughs> what do you even want to do? And I had wanted to do the same thing for really the pre the past 10 years, yeah. which was have a fully well-rounded, developed interiors team that could compete on a daily basis for the best projects in this city. Yeah. At that time in this city was my frame of reference. It, it would obviously then grow to grow. be in the country. Yeah. Um, and and now knowing Bob so well, you can imagine that he was like, <laughs> oh yeah, that's what we want to do. <laughs> and then I met Dawn, right, I had met her before because um, I had lost a project to her, a big law firm project, not too long before. But some of the feedback that the client had given was that the team he actually actually wanted was the Corgan team plus this girl <laughs> who was on another team and Don had never forgotten that and when we sat down to talk about like her vision for the team she was leading and where you know Corgan interiors could kind of go it was our our match was yeah. made pretty immediately and and really if I look across my career, probably the most impactful relationship. I mean, we have complete different sets of strengths, which has been the secret sauce from the beginning. Yeah. She had this resume of big, complicated projects. I had a resume of pretty small projects, um, but high profile, and I knew a ton of people. And so when, I, when, I, when we brought all that together, we really started seeing great opportunities pretty quickly with fossil kind of being a real a real turning point yeah. in the development of the Dallas studio it's funny because when I, I, I just until actually in the last couple of years I never thought of you and Don not being together the whole time because you're <laughs> you're such like two peas in a pod such a great pairing <laughs> yeah but we disagree all the time I mean which is a good thing <laughs> it really I think we both now encourage throughout the firm partnerships yeah. because if you have somebody who's like mm, that's not what I heard or I don't think that's what you know, the team is really wanting, or yeah. I don't think that's what people are really asking for. And we flip roles all the time. We always say, if someone ever got a hold of our tech strings, <laughs> they would be so confused because the, the, the pace in which we switch from like talking about a show on Netflix to like an <laughs> issue on the team to, you know, a pursuit happens very quickly <laughs> very fluidly and rarely do we kind of misfire but yesterday there was one where it was just like it had a couple numbers and a name of a project and a fee question mark and I was like are you questioning my fee on that project <laughs> and she was like no I was asking you if that was the right fee and so it's pretty it's a, it's been really really fun and it's the reason we've gotten to where but it's I mean, today. so that's important having somebody that you can really you know kind of rub up against and and I think probably collaboratively conf conflict with is important. Oh, for sure. And it allowed, it really allowed the development of the rest of this sector. So, I mean, da the Dallas Interior Studio is still the engine of the interior sector. It mm -hmm. is by far still the largest team with the largest amount of revenue and, and the most high profile reputation. Right. But because Dawn has been leading that team with a ton of strong leaders around her as well, then I've been able to work with all these other cities, hire, hiring incredible leaders yeah. in Austin, in LA, in Houston, um, in Phoenix, which Dawn works really, really closely with it's the Phoenix. It's funny, I look at this, I know this was yeah. from a couple of years ago, but I see like New York and I see LA and I see Phoenix Houston. and Houston and you just kind of see them from all over the place. Yeah, so this awesome. was the last time we were able to get all of the officers Obviously from the interiors <laughs> team together. Pre-COVID, yes, yeah. we're all, but it's an incredible, you know, this is what makes me so proud and excited today, which I yeah. never would have imagined. Like these people are the best in the business, a hundred percent. So, um, 
let's I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit in terms of your journey um, you know the last time we had you on the square it was for the um, women in the workplace panel mm. so tell me a little bit about ha, has being female or as young as you are been a hindrance in your career no and I feel like I get asked that question I've spent a lot of time thinking about it because I get asked that question a fair amount obviously in the past couple of years it, for me, it has always been looking for a firm that really valued interior design mm -hmm. in their firm. So a multi a multidisciplinary firm that put a high value on interiors. Now, then when you take that and say, still, the majority of interior designers are, are women, yeah. you've kind of got two things that, that marry up. So one, looking to have interior design as a profession and as a contributing part of a multidisciplinary firm really be valued and thereby having an interiors leader as part of the leadership in large firms. So that's been really important to me. Um, I mean, I can definitely think back every once in a while, it still happens and it floors me. You look around a room and realize you're the only woman. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen very often. Um, usually because there's more women from Corgan that are with me in that same in that same meeting. So I think a lot is changing. But yeah, I can remember times thinking, huh, I wonder I wonder if I'm not getting that opportunity. Yeah. Because but then I've had so many opportunities and so many men who've been incredibly supportive in my career, along with women who've been support like there's all those few. guys. <laughs> That's a motley looking crew. Yeah, so that was that was after I had been promoted to join what then when we had a management committee structure right. before. This was when Bob was still the leading the firm. Bob was the CEO, yes. And this was a, a management committee kind of at the beginning of working through the next leadership the transition. leadership transition, which was really cool. And I felt I felt like I deserved my seat at the table and they certainly treated me from the beginning as a as a partner. So as a leader we uh, had a conversation with Matt Mooney a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things that he he really praised um, the leadership, you know, with with C Jack and David and Bob and John uh, Holtz, and um, then obviously the present leadership. And but one of the things he mentioned was a lot of times he felt like they had to put their first love a little bit to the side in order to take on the mantle of leadership. Mm. Um, and you know, with David and his passion for aviation, but he, it's not that he didn't do it anymore, but he just, he allowed taking on the mantle mm -hmm. of the firm and Bob and, and subsequent leaders. Do you, do you feel like a, a, a balance that you have to work there or do you feel a fulfillment versus leadership kind of fulfillment or? Well, I think, you know, what came out of what ended up being a really fantastic kind of transition process that we went through over the course of a little more than three years was that Steve and I both, Steve Holsey and I both felt strongly that we did not want to get out of the practices that we were in uh, for a couple of reasons. One being as fast as the industry is changing, we all felt, Scott included, that it was important that we really kept a sense of what was going on with our clients. Like if we were gonna lead this firm, not even knowing that COVID was gonna come down sure. the pike, yeah. you know, in the early, early phases of our leadership, but that we needed to know what was going on with our customers. So by splitting the roles of CEO and president in the firm for the first time from just one person, there had always just been you know, David, well, C Jack, David, and Bob were president and CEO of Corgan. Right. We took the role that was held by one person and split it between three. Right. Um, which then did allow for a little more balance. And then in that in that kind of transition time, I was much more engaged with marketing, with branding, with culture, communications, uh, with the evolution of our HR team. And Steve was much more engaged with starting new offices, with our BD director network. And so it kind of naturally sorted out in how we could best influence areas of the firm's growth and development. You know, we uh, we did a project a couple years ago for a um, a financial company um, who had two CEOs, and I remember being in the room with them um, discussing the project and thinking, "Man, this 
this really works for them. And it's because of their, they had graduated together um, and had kind of started this business together. And it, it worked because they, they had that relationship and that trust. Thinking of you know, two presidents and a CEO, um, it, for a lot of people, it might not work, but for you guys, it really does. It really does. And it's kind I mean, there's no fear of conflict, but we all three are pretty level, you know, we'll state our opinion, mm -hmm. hear out the others, we'll talk through it. And, and what I think we put our finger on it at some point, nobody's afraid to kind of bring something up early in its development. Yeah. Like there's never been this need, like I have to fully bake this presentation. I yeah. have to figure out every bit of this before I present it to my partners. No, it is definitely like, okay, I had this idea. I haven't sketched on a napkin from a bar. <laughs> yeah. And it will either grow from that point or be like, meh. Yeah. You know, maybe not now, maybe yeah. not, not the time. And so that kind of communication that's really easy, but also honest, I think is why it works. Now, if you had either one of them sitting here, well, one, Steve would never take that long to describe that. <laughs> He would just be like, yeah, no, it works. It's good. We all get along. Um, and, and Scott would probably say something slightly different. So, so shifting back a little bit more to design, how have you seen that change from when you were an intern to now, you know, being a president and you've, you've been through so many, you know, to what you were talking about earlier, thinking of design as an industry and well-rounded on the artist side and the business side and the yeah. people side. How have you seen that change? Well, people are probably tired of hearing me say right now, there's been no better time to be a designer, mm -hmm. an architect or an interior designer. I mean, the focus on the built environment, the democratization of design, that appreciation for good design and what that means, it really is exciting. Mm -hmm. Interiors projects have evolved over my, you know, almost 25 year career from being, okay, we need 300 people and our budget is, you know, $40 a square foot, go yeah. to, we want to engage, you know, 50 of our employees in the process to understand how they want to work in the future. We want to figure out a strategy. We want to incorporate branding and change management and sustainability and wellness to this ecosystem of what the workplace is. Yeah. So the the transformation is crazy. The the other side of the coin is how competitive it is and how many incredibly talented design firms there are out there. So it is still an industry that you really have to protect your value and your services and here's why, you know, these services are worth what they're worth and what our team and our experience is bringing to it. That's probably the design part is easy, right? Yeah. We have the talent in spades here. The people that work here are incredible. The harder part is winning and winning at a fee that is fair uh, reflection of our value. Have you seen changes in kind of the ideology in terms of materiality? I mean, I know sustainability is a much bigger thing now in terms of materials and, and that kind of thing. Well probably the most marked difference would be one in just the strategy develop. Why are we doing what we're doing? Mm -hmm. And so the workplace strategy practice that Emily Strain founded is really uh, rises up from that, that our clients want more of that. The branding layered on top of the great design that the team is doing, that Paige Terrell and her team yep. are doing. And then that the furniture is such a particular part and really makes a project sing and it is a credible expense to the project that Jasmine Effersey and her team. So you take our crew of really talented interior designers and project managers, and then you start layering on all these specialties on top of it. I mean, that's what's changed. The, a beautiful project has so many layers now. Yeah. And I mean, we've been saying this a ton lately, right? Design is a team sport. Right. I mean, when you look at the best of the best, how many people touched it and how many ideas and talents influenced the work it's pretty mind boggling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to be a cog, I mean, that's what I love really is being part of a team to be a cog in the wheel of any of these projects. I is more than I really ever imagined. <laughs> what do you think the next five, 10 years are? I mean, obviously COVID threw a, a huge 
wrench in that same wheel. Yeah. <laughs> um, but but at the same time, it's also allowed as Samantha, the director of Hugo, has mentioned multiple times. It's become a catalyst for a lot of things that not, aren't necessarily new. They were already kind of starting to yeah. happen, but have been a catalyst for things to happen sooner. How has that affected the interior design industry? So this is going to sound weird, but it has become at the same time more global and more local. Okay. And I think that we're going to keep seeing. All so right. relate. what we've seen coming out of COVID is how important relationships mm. our clients have come back to us. People who trusted us before are trusting us now. They're referring us to other people. But at the same time, we're seeing bigger clients wanting us to cover more area, serve projects and strategy really across the world. So figuring out the challenge that I think we have ahead for our leaders is figuring out how to do both. How do we stay super present in our local markets and continue to add studios in other cities that build those relationships that kind of drive local projects, but expand our services to where we can really serve these global clients as well. I think that's our biggest challenge. Yeah. We have the talent to do anything. Yeah. That is what I spend the time kind of trying to figure out. So knowing that, what are what would be the advice that you would have for people, you know, just coming out of school, just getting in the design industry? You know, there was a trek, the Real Estate Council here in Dallas posted on their Instagram or something yesterday, a quote from um, Jeff Swope, who was one of the founding members of Trek and uh, at Champion Partners, and it said, "Just get in the game," <laughs> and I loved it. He it, it was something along the lines, of, and it was talking about real estate in yeah. Dallas Fort Worth. But you know, don't worry about the company, the title, or he said, no matter the company, the title, the sal just like get in the game. I think that is what I would say. Just get in there and start building your network, your yeah. resume, your knowledge, your expertise. Um, and figure it out. I love that. Don't don't sit on the sidelines waiting for the perfect play. Just get in there and go. Yeah, and I do see that. I think COVID gave us all a ton of time to like think, rip up the five-year plan. What's the one-year plan? Yeah. And then keep evaluating it. I think there can be a little too much. Well, I want to be here in five years. And then a resistance to kind of just get on the path and see where it takes you. I, You're a big proponent of doing that reevaluation. Oh, I am because I don't even know. Whatever my five year plan was when I was 25 years old, <laughs> I guarantee you it was way too small yeah. that I never would have known what opportunities were going to appear. I'm a big proponent of reevaluating your goals constantly for being uncomfortable, for raising your hand when you're not sure if you have exactly all the knowledge or expertise, but then surround yourself with people that can help you and know when to raise your hand. So yes, I am a proponent of that. Love that. I think, again, the idea of COVID, you, that's one of those ideas that whether or not it was popular before COVID, it's a, it's, it's a definite example of why it's important now. Yes, I agree. Um, so you, had, you mentioned raising your hand when you're unsure of something or you, know, you feel like there's more information needed. Um, and that is, there is some art to that <laughs> because you don't want to be the person always asking all the questions, especially if they've already given you the information. Sure. But having that, that confidence and that openness to do that, it, it's pretty important. I mean, I've talked about this some before. I mean, y being an advocate for your own career mm. is important. And so being willing to ask the question, to volunteer for the pursuit or the presentation. I mean, there are so many opportunities and it's like, who who wants to step into this role? Who wants to take this initiative on the team? Who yeah. wants to deliver this message? And just putting yourself out there, I think is, is important. Probably I did it the most when there was opportunities for business development engagement, which is nerve wracking to go to a big event. You don't yeah. know how many people you're going to know. If you go to a few, you will know people yeah. at the <laughs> at the next one. But it is scary yeah. um, for sure. But that's probably some of the things I did early on. What have you found that's important outside of work? Like, so what is it that you that fulfills you? I'm sure Jack's going to play Jack and Craig oh, are yeah. going to play in here somewhere. For sure. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so I have a son, Jack, he's 11 now. Um, and my husband Craig is in the, oh, 
there we are. <laughs> and my ha ha look, even in a Corgan shirt, that's pretty good. We'll have to find um, the clip of Jack because we, we, we love to use Jack when we're doing different projects. And we were doing one for uh, a PGA project. And we had the drone and he was able to hit the ball. We wanted him to hit it towards the drone. He hit it like yeah. a foot over it. I mean, it could not have been any closer, and he nailed it. It was great. He will still claim to this day that he was totally aiming intentional. <laughs> at the drone, which I don't know if that was true, but yes, that was awesome. The, and the ability, more so pre-COVID, and I really look forward to that being back that way, yeah. of him being around the firm, of seeing people's kids up here yeah. when they were running in to get something, or you know, had a little delay between school and an yeah. activity. Um, because he he really loves being being around here, but yeah, having kid having a child um, definitely changed some priorities. And I think for me, and and I see this with a lot of parents, it really f helps you focus your totally. effort and attention better. You've got you have to be somewhere to pick up a small human, yeah. and then you have all these things that need to get done. So um, a pa an army of parents tends to be a pretty darn effective <laughs> um, workforce. So. This is a picture, we love Colorado in the summer. So planning trips, doing outdoorsy and adventure things. I was gonna say, you guys love, your Instagram is filled with outdoorsy stuff. We do, uh, you know, it's not, uh, we're not a sit, we love a beach vacation, but <laughs> we can only do that for a couple of days. We much more prefer kind of some adventurous, and you have boys, you yeah. know, you kind of have to, the energy must be burned. You can only do that for a couple of hours and then you've, they've got to be doing something. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, and one, one thing that was really difficult during COVID, the separation of work and home, mm. just it's how I'm wired. Yeah. And I really make an effort when I leave here at the end of the day, unless there's something incredibly pressing, that's it. Like you cut off. I cut off yeah. and my teams know, I mean, there is not a lot of email on our teams. Again, unless if you see one, it is probably Important. a pressing yeah. issue. Otherwise, it shouldn't be sent after hours or on the weekend because that separation for me is just really key. And when I'm here, I'm all in. So we're going to bring up a couple of pictures and okay. you're going to get to explain or slash tell me a story. We, we gathered these from a few different people. Well, I'm just so glad there aren't there isn't that much photo evidence. I mean, the 90s were awesome because there were no... Our kids are going to have so much more photo evidence oh, of us. <laughs> so much. So tell me about this. So I really had a leadership role when we started the renovation here at 401 of kind of since we have the knowledge in the interiors team of helping people kind of get ready for workplace renovation, yeah. I was very passionate about our purge party. When, <laughs> and this is just a small piece of evidence of how much we needed to purge around here back then. And Mark is there for size reference of how tall um, the stack There's of drawings are. a lot are. of stuff And recycled. it turns out we didn't need all those drawings. They yeah. never returned in this volume after that. Wow, that's good. Um, all right, next. This was for the birthday party project. You know, I've always loved as part of our team, the Dallas studio here and all of our studios, just that community engagement yeah. and getting out there and doing stuff in the birthday party project. is such a great organization. Yeah, so this was a crew. We did several parties that year. Um, it's always really fun That's to do awesome. that as a team. Next is? Oh, the guys. yeah. So this is when it is obvious that you're the only, I do, obviously <laughs> I took this picture. They didn't plan to dress alike. <laughs> they just coordinated naturally. So at least being, you know, for a while, the only woman in the leadership team, I brought some, uh, some fashion and yeah. color to the group. <laughs> now, you know, with Elizabeth, Maureen, Stephanie, we, we get a, a the, there's bringing, more variety. Yeah, you bring more variety. I am, you know, while in we're, fashion anyway, while we're looking at these guys, I was uh, one thing that's been very impressive to me, even since literally the first day I started here. Um, you know, we've we've done projects for larger companies, Fortune 100 companies, and um, I've had the opportunity to tour those and film them and whatnot. And I've always been impressed, or I've always yeah, I've always been impressed at how open door Corgan is. You know, those those other companies, a lot of times, part of the design is having probably for practical reasons as well, multiple security points before you can get mm -hmm. to like a CEO or a president. Yeah. When I look at, at, at these guys and, you know, uh, with Bob and with the various leaders of the firm, I remember from day one, literally their doors were open. Like you could, anybody could walk right up there. 
you and and uh, Steve and Scott have that same policy. You know, it's not like you're hidden anywhere that nobody can get to. You're where people can come and talk to you and they have any kind of an issue. What's yeah. the importance behind that? I mean, the importance behind that is that's how Corgan was founded and created, you know, that that it we are only uh, responsible for the firm for a short period of time as its leaders. And I mean, when you look at firms and their leadership transitions, ours is extremely unique for a firm originally founded and named by a single person to have been through this many leadership transitions and only grown and flourished under that. There has never been a dip in, from a leadership transition in our firm. Our challenges have always been economic related yeah. or related to other, you know, problems in, in our different industries or cities, never from a leadership transition. And that is something I think we have a lot of pride about, that we are just responsible for a period of time and then Corgan belongs to every person that works here. <laughs> Matt Mooney jokingly called it a peaceful coup, which yeah, I thought sure. was kind of funny yeah. because each of the, the leadership kind of regimes that have come through have really, um, at least in my experience, built upon what came before them in a different way. So yeah. it's, it's never been, well, I'm going to change how the old people, you know, did it. It's always been, I'm going to take this as a starting point, as a new foundation and continue to kind of add my, my paint, my brushstrokes to the painting. Absolutely. You will never hear Scott say, my firm. Mm -hmm. You would never hear me or Steve say, my firm. You never heard Bob Morris say, my firm. I mean, this is our firm yeah and i think that is should be hardwired in everybody that works here and that's why i think those transitions those peaceful coups as matt <laughs> says it um have been pretty seamless if you look back across across all of them i'm all the way back to jack to david lind so as a president what do you think our future is over the next five ten how many every years you know Obviously, COVID was jarring in a way because, and we, we did joke after we got through kind of the most difficult parts, we have joked um, amongst ourselves like, well, this is not what we signed up for. We took yeah. over a firm that had a, a line that went like this. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it just got bigger every year. It grew every year. And then to be faced with something so out of our control, I think what we saw um, as we got further along and, and were able to kind of see the future that so many of the things that so many people had worked so hard to put in place. Bob Ray's with our IT systems, how quickly we were able to shift mm -hmm. to the cloud is I mean, it was all, it was basically a weekend that it took. It was a weekend. It was a lot of projects. It was a lot of projects. If he and his team and Chuck Blackford and their teams had not already started that process, yeah. who knows? Yeah. We had already established those relationships. We had already established you know, our cloud presence. And so that was able to happen. Everything Maureen and Ahad and their team have. So, so many uh, through all of our shared service groups, the foundations that had already been put in for the firm to continue to grow. I think we felt really validated when we saw how we were able to perform. And the firm has always been, and this goes all the way back, a balance of really conservative financial practices with risk that makes sense. So we are not risk averse. And if anything, Steve and Scott and I are probably bigger risk takers, which I think is what the t you asked the question right. was. Right. What does this next five years demand knowing when to take a risk? I mean, firms of our size are few and far between. They're either bigger or smaller. There's only a few firms in this 500 to 1,000 kind of employee place. Right. Um, we're an extremely healthy firm. And so continuing to take smart risks to grow, grow meaning a lot of different things. Grow doesn't always just mean numbers. numbers. Right. It also means in, in practices, in the services we provide, 
and in the places that we are and the clients that we that we work with all of those things are growth and if you look at the growth and development of the media lab of mm -hmm. hugo of the model shop i think all those things are indicators that we're going to keep responding to what's going on in the world to serve our clients better so along that same lines of having those boundaries between work and life um, and, and personal time is there is there like a retreat that you go to or something that you try and do every year just to try and get away and recharge so I some of my very best friends are friends from third grade yeah <laughs> there's a group of us my college roommate and best friend from like third grade and actually a friend who I originally met in kindergarten and then we reconnected in college we we typically try to meet up at least once a year somewhere that's convenient we I mean now we're just old ladies I mean we want to go to antique stores and drink <laughs> wine and so that's really important and having having good friends at work and not at work. Yeah. I think that's an important thing that I always try to encourage. Um, oh, look, you found it. That's awesome. Instagram. <laughs> so that's, we were missing one. We were missing Rebecca, my college roommate on that trip. But that, yes, Nikki and I met uh, when we were eight years old. Wow. Our, our birthdays are very close together and our moms forced us to play to, together because that was like a common bond. You know, I actually, Instagram, you know, anybody on the team who, wants to follow me on Instagram and vice versa. I do welcome that for all the evils of social media. I do you, you think- like, You're a big proponent of social media. I'm a big proponent of yeah. Instagram for sure. And then LinkedIn for, for, for more career and work purposes. But I think it is a way to kind of create connection and show people what's going on in your life. I mean, if you're going to share it, with people you work with, you've got to make sure you have the right boundaries. But I mean, a lot of great conversations happen when you see where somebody goes on a trip. We, yeah. we do spend a lot of time in Colorado. We are planning a trip finally to Europe. Jack has been dying to go to Europe. <laughs> uh, that one is from Big Bend. That's and awesome. actually, you know, I went to, to people on the team and in the firm who had been to Big Ben before because I knew that from Instagram yeah. to get information. So I do think there are pluses to social media when yeah. when used appropriately so i'll give a shameless plug can you go back up to the top for me luke so um one of the reasons why the square is currently oh. available on multiple audio platforms is because of jack wilson's podcast um which i want to hear a little bit more about from you but he he was he, i remember you coming and go well Jack was able to, chatting about chapters, Jack was able yeah. to get his up. How are we doing on the square? Which was a really nice mm -hmm. way of saying, you know, if my 10 year old can do it, there's no reason you can't. Yes, um, COVID, COVID project exactly. by Jack Wilson. He came to us, um, oh, look at his 4.9 uh, rating. <laughs> rating. Um, he came to us and he had found these articles and, and I still remember he was like, I wanna start a podcast you know, since they weren't going to school. Right. And, and I was like, okay, is that, you know, how much does it cost? What do we need? And he's like, I need this microphone. He had found this article. He's like, I need this microphone and everything else is free. And Craig and I were like, there's no way it's free. Yeah. It was free. It was free yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we sent he since has so many episodes that we have to pay to host them okay. um that you know you only get so much free right. but he was a hundred percent right the editing software and it's been really it's been really fun well so big proponent we'll put a link down in the description you should go check out about <laughs> as you can see it's not chapters. a huge time investment the <laughs> yeah. episodes he keeps them short pretty short we probably need to take a little bit of a of a page out of his book quite he, literally he uh <laughs> he he reviews a book he does a great job of telling you what age group he thinks it's for he writes it and then he tells you what he's reading next sometimes he throws in some movies too that's awesome. but that's been really that's been really fun and and all the people on uh, on the team and in the sector have been really cool about <laughs> that awesome. about the podcast all right one last uh picture really video i need some explanation for because don sent this oh great and said i had to bring it up um it looks 
like, and I, we'll we'll put the sound in. Well, this isn't fair when you take one person out of context from a whole. I mean, you've really got take. the T Swift thing going on there. I mean, let's just say I was a tap dancer until I was 18 years old. Oh my word! And uh, one of my retirement plans is to be one of the Texas Two Steppers. Just everyone should know those are the ladies who perform at halftime at the Mavs games that have like the Texas yeah, skirt yeah, yeah, sure. that are tapping. Yeah. I can see it. Absolutely. Yeah. Tap and dancing till you were 18. And Shelly Slater wants to tap, too. We have this whole thing about eventually we're going to get back in our tap in our tap shoes. Well, so, so I have moves. Now, that was for a whole team thing, and there's a bunch of other people that did it, too. But <laughs> We're just going to solo you out I'm, on it. I'm, I'm always game. Well, when you, when you finally make it uh, as one of the tap dancers, we will have you back on with all kinds of videos. With my crew? <laughs> exactly. So one last question. If you could put anybody in your seat that's here at Corrigan to, to have a conversation like this with, who would you want to see there? So this person would strike fear into the hearts of many. Perfect. <laughs> because Don has all the stories. Yes. And a fantastic memory. So she could go in the Wayback Machine, you know, 35 years. Perfect. Yeah. Well, we'll have to call Adam. We're going to have to call Don. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Lindsay. I really appreciate you spending the time. Thank you for watching and or listening. If you would like to listen to us in the car as you're driving, check out one of the many uh, podcast platforms. Um, they're down in the description. Make sure you check out Jack's podcast. Chatting about which, chapters. Yes, which is also going to be down in the description. And check out the next episode coming up soon.